One by one, territories joined together, creating a patchwork nation of 50 different states, united, but each with its own history, spirit, culture, and landmarks. Let's explore the history of five of them. Illinois, Connecticut, Nevada, Mississippi, and Wyoming. Welcome to the States. If there were one state that could be called a true microcosm of America, a state with a good balance of factories and farms, a diverse population, a broad economic base, and a central location, this would be the place. Greetings from Illinois, America's 21st state, which joined the Union on December 3rd, 1818. Its population of nearly 13 million people ranks it fifth in the nation. I think what I miss most about Illinois is the way it looks. I think I really miss the way Chicago has such a, a sense of history to it because of its architecture. I miss the, the fabulous museums that they have there, the whole lakefront. I miss driving up Lakeshore Drive. I miss Lincoln Park Zoo. So I miss all the things that I knew as a kid that are still there, and I'm just so glad that they are still there for someone else to enjoy them. If you ask a Chicagoan where they're from, they say they're from Chicago, period. They would never put comma Illinois. There is a sense that Chicago is in of itself, in the same way in which New York and New Yorkers feel about their city. But the second city is second to none when it comes to landmarks. In downtown Chicago, one of the world's largest public libraries is the 756,000 square foot Harold Washington Library Center. Opened in 1991, its nine floors hold over 10.7 million volumes. A few blocks away, you'll find the tallest building in North America, the third tallest in the world. The Sears Tower contains enough steel to build 69,000 automobiles and enough telephone wiring to wrap around the world 1.75 times. Not to be outdone, the Field Museum houses the largest and most complete T-Rex fossil yet discovered. The dino, affectionately named Sue, was unearthed in South Dakota and acquired by the museum in 1997. Even with all these astonishing attributes, the state's greatest claim to fame is one of America's most revered icons, a man who was actually born in Kentucky. We readily acknowledge Lincoln was born in Kentucky, and we also acknowledge the time he spent in Indiana, but he chose Illinois to be his home state. If Illinois is the land of Lincoln, then Springfield is clearly its epicenter. This was his home for 25 years, where he first worked as a lawyer, married, and raised his family. Today, Springfield is home to the first and only Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, which opened in 2005. The state-of-the-art facility is filled with high-tech exhibits to attract visitors in the 21st century. Audiences are enthralled by a theatrical presentation that incorporates live actors and special effects to bring Abraham Lincoln to life. In that government of the people, by the people, for the people, there is so much here for those interested in the 16th president, including one little-known piece of Lincoln lore. Abraham Lincoln became involved in an affair of honor with another prominent politician in, in the state, James Shields. The two men were from opposite political parties and at odds over some state business. When an anonymous letter appeared in the Sangamo Journal of Springfield attacking Shields' character and his Irish ethnicity, Shields suspected Lincoln's soon-to-be wife, Mary Todd, or Lincoln himself. Shields confronted Lincoln, expecting an apology. And when Lincoln wasn't forthcoming with the retraction, he issued a challenge to a duel. Illinois didn't allow dueling, and it required them to go to an island on the Missouri side of the Mississippi. Lincoln, however, got to choose weapons. Lincoln's choice was unorthodox, cavalry broadswords of the largest size. He figured that with swords, he could easily disarm Shields. Pistols, on the other hand, would likely end in at least one death. Lincoln was 6'4". Shields was 5'9". A tall man by his day, but not to Lincoln's gigantic standards. And to go ahead and try to approach Lincoln uh, with a sword, with that kind of reach advantage, was something that was daunting for Shields. Some say that Lincoln essentially wanted to make the duel as foolish and comic as possible, so as to mock Shields and to prevent the thing from reaching a violent outcome. In the face of this obvious mismatch, Shields was persuaded to accept the promise of a written apology from Lincoln. After this unfortunate incident, the men became personal and professional friends for the rest of their careers, demonstrating Lincoln's uncanny ability to turn former opponents into political allies. Geographically, Illinois stretches the bounds of North and South. 
Chicago famously suffers the harsh winters of Lake Michigan, while the southernmost town is actually farther south than Richmond, Virginia. But central Illinois is where you'll find one secret of the state's success. It's soil. In this part of the country, the corn and soybeans are the two main crops that are grown here. Farmland in central Illinois is $5,000 an acre, so pretty good land. Illinois also once had the largest, most sophisticated Native American civilization north of Mexico. According to archaeological finds, the city of Cahokia was inhabited from about 800 A.D. to 1400 A.D. It covered nearly six square miles, with a population as high as 20,000 people. This was a center of religion and learning, and its people built huge pyramids, designed solar observatories, even practiced human sacrifice. The exact fate of the prehistoric Cahokians and their city remains unknown. Cahokia declined as an urban center between 1300 A.D. and 1400 A.D. By 1400, the site was basically abandoned. Why did this happen? It's a mystery. We think some of the factors involved are depletion of resources, you know, cutting down all the trees to build these walls for building all the thousands of houses and the firewood they need every day for cooking and heating for thousands of people. And not just Cahokia, but all these other hundreds of surrounding communities too, which are competing for these resources. Today, along the Mississippi Riverbanks, archeologists continue to dig for clues, hoping to solve the ancient mystery of Illinois' great pyramid builders. In the 1920s, however, there was no mystery about who was the most powerful and intimidating force in Illinois. It was a mobster named Al Capone. Chicagoans enjoy the reputation of Al Capone uh, as a savvy, streetwise, uh, big-shouldered kind of guy. The city of Chicago, however, is a bit ashamed that its most famous citizen would be someone associated with brothels, prohibition violations, gambling, and criminal racketeering. Alphonse Capone grew up in New York City amidst gang warfare. After killing a man in Brooklyn, Al was sent by the mob to cool off in Chicago. There, his New York mentor, Johnny Torrio, soon called upon the 22-year-old Capone to run his new club, the Four Deuces, a speakeasy, gambling joint, and whorehouse all in one. Around that time, a new constitutional amendment drastically changed America. Prohibition made alcohol illegal and made men like Al Capone rich and powerful. Capone was sort of a melting pot mobster. He was not a member of the Italian mafia or anything like that. He was a second generation American and he worked with Irish Americans, he worked with Orthodox Jews, he worked with Greek Americans, Polish Americans. In the jazz clubs he ran, he had black musicians. He was not a person of prejudices. He was somebody who saw bringing people together through organized crime was a way to make the most money. In 1929, Capone was at the height of his power and influence. But on Valentine's Day of that year, he made what would turn out to be his fatal mistake. He ordered the death of his rival, Bugs Moran. Capone's hitmen dressed up as police, lined up seven gangsters in a garage in downtown Chicago, and mowed them down. They didn't know it at the time, but Moran was not even there. It was because of the St. Valentine's Day massacre that uh, President Herbert Hoover decided to go ahead and really focus federal resources on uh, putting Al Capone behind bars. It took two years, but what finally got Capone in the end was not a charge of murder, extortion, or liquor running. It was tax evasion. When Al Capone entered prison in 1931, prohibition was nearing its end. With it, an infamous chapter in the state's history was all but over. Since those dark days, Illinois has taken its place among the most robust states in the nation, with expanded economic opportunities, a rebuilt infrastructure, and a strong, diverse economy. I'm proud to have come from Illinois because I think it has a more open attitude as a state. And I think it's because they have the down-home feeling of the farm country, and then they have that sophistication of uh, Chicago all wrapped up in one state. In this New England state, early Dutch settlers bought land along a major river from the Pequot Indians. The payment included six axes, six kettles, 18 knives, and a sword blade. Greetings from Connecticut, the fifth of the original 13 colonies to ratify the U.S. Constitution. It became part of the Union on January 9, 1788. With 3.5 million people, it ranks number 29 in population. The beauty of Connecticut is that it's both city and country. It's just 100 by 50 miles. So you can drive lengthwise in two hours and north-south in about a, a buck and a half. And it changes a lot, a lot more than most states that you'll pass through in a one-hour drive. Though famed for its rural charm, Connecticut derives most of its wealth from industry and has since the middle of the 18th century. 
Connecticut was the Silicon Valley of its age, only the chips were machine tools. We bought into the industrial notion early, early on and profited by it uh, enormously. It was the transforming force uh, in this state. It defined everything that happened here for well over a century. From the vulcanized rubber of Charles Goodyear to the guns of Samuel Colt, Connecticut inventors created entire industries. And for good measure, this is also the place where, in the 1920s, Yale students turned pie tins from the Frisbee Pie Company into flying saucers, thus giving birth to the ubiquitous Frisbee. New England politics have always tended toward the theatrical. But when Connecticut-born P.T. Barnum became a state legislator, the jokes about politicians and clowns were almost too easy. Well, it doesn't surprise me because there's a lot of people in politics today that should be in a circus. This place, however, is no laughing matter. The Library of Congress named it a Connecticut legacy, and the New Haven Preservation Trust gave it a plaque. Other states may dispute it, but anyone in Connecticut will tell you that the first hamburgers in U.S. history were served at Louis' lunch. The best invention in the history of Connecticut is the invention of the hamburger. The first hamburger was made and sold at Louis' lunch, which is this little shack. It's still open for lunch in downtown New Haven. Louis ran a small lunch wagon selling steak sandwiches to local factory workers. A frugal businessman, legend has it that he didn't like to waste the excess beef from his daily lunch rush. So he ground up some scraps and served it between pieces of toasted bread. An American classic was born. Connecticut calls itself the Constitution State because of a set of laws adopted in 1639. Connecticut had a problem. Whereas places like Massachusetts and Virginia started with patents from the king or charters from the company, Connecticut's people had just kind of wandered off and started a colony. And there's no uh, presiding authority. So how do they set up a society that would run? In 1639, they created the document called the Fundamental Orders, which Connecticut takes pride in calling the first constitution ever written. England, however, wanted to impose control on the independent-minded colony and merge Connecticut into a province that would include all of New England. Sir Edmund Andros, who had been appointed governor of New England by the king, was ordered to take away Connecticut's new charter. And he meant business. He came to Hartford with 70 soldiers. 70 soldiers doesn't sound like many, maybe, until you see them on your front lawn. And he came to a meeting of the Connecticut General Assembly. He read a decree from the king saying, I want the charter back. As Andros waited, the candles in the room suddenly flickered out. And at that point, another person picks up the charter, which is on the table in front of him, and hands it out the window to Captain Wadsworth, who spirits it down the street and puts the charter in the hollow of an old oak tree. And the charter oak, the place where the charter was saved, became over time for Connecticut probably the most important single symbol of the state and of what the state stands for. Whether the candles went out by accident or by design is an enduring Connecticut mystery. If I was to speculate on that, they knew it was a breeze outside that night, and I bet you the wind, somebody got up and said, let me open up this window, and sat back down, and all of a sudden... We might think that, you know, well, we should know the details. Somebody should have come forth and, you know, done a, a tell-all biography, how I hid the charter. 17th century people could keep a secret. It's no secret that for hundreds of years, the people of Connecticut worked the open waters of the Atlantic and Long Island Sound, fishing, whaling, oystering, and shipbuilding. The sea has been the lifeblood for towns like Misty. Connecticut has always been a shipbuilding uh, center. Availability of timber, good deep water, protected harbors. The Mystic River, particularly, was an early site of shipbuilding. Even before sailing ships were replaced by steam-powered vessels, Connecticut had pioneered a very different way to navigate the sea, traveling under it. If Connecticut has any unique distinction, it's, it's as the submarine capital of the world. Even as far back as the American Revolution, David Bushnell developed a little submarine called the Turtle and actually came close to uh, exploding a, uh, a torpedo next to a British ship in uh, New York Harbor. Another tradition was born, and Connecticut later became known as the submarine state. During World War II, Electric Boat's 12,500 employees launched 74 submarines at their plant in Groton. These 74 vessels accounted for 39% of all Japanese ships sunk. The Cold War sparked more innovation. The Soviet Union's launch of its Sputnik satellite created deep fears of an atomic Russia. President Dwight Eisenhower asked Electric Boat to develop a new kind of submarine, a nuclear sub that could launch nuclear missiles from any part of the Earth's oceans. The president made a commitment that that ship 
which was capable of firing missiles, was going to go to sea before 1960. And on December 31st, 1959, that ship went to sea and fulfilled that requirement. And it was quite a feather in our cap. And it was an event comparable with the launching of that satellite. Connecticut's maritime tradition actually gave birth to its principal industry, insurance. As more ships set sail for England, the West Indies, and the Far East, merchants became concerned about the inherent risks to their thriving trade, fires, pirates, storms, and accidents. The insurance industry was created when groups of merchants began to share these risks. On the bitterly cold night of December 16, 1835, a fire in a wooden building in downtown New York City quickly spread through a 20-square block area of Manhattan's burgeoning financial district, destroying nearly 700 buildings. Estimated damages of $26 million bankrupted all but three of the city's 26 fire insurance companies. It was Hartford's insurance companies that ultimately helped the city get back on its feet and established Connecticut's capital as the insurance capital of the world. As technology advanced, Hartford's insurance companies kept pace by specializing and offering different kinds of specialized protection to both individuals and whole new industries. In 1920, the Hartford Insurance Company insured Yankee slugger Babe Ruth to protect his earnings in the event of sickness. In the 1930s, they wrote contract bonds for large-scale projects like the Hoover Dam and San Francisco's favorite landmark, the Golden Gate Bridge. The defining characteristic of the insurance industry here was that it spread itself out over almost everything. That, uh, that if you wanted insurance for any purpose, uh, Hartford was the place to look. This state entered the Union in the midst of the Civil War, just over a year after the terrible battle at Gettysburg. Thus, their motto, Battle Born. Greetings from Nevada, the 36th state to join the Union, which it did on Halloween, 1864. It has 2.5 million residents, making it the 35th most popular state. The common misperception is that everything is legal out here, that there's just, there's just gambling and alcohol and drugs and prostitution. And that's, uh, well, that's true. All of those are true. But uh, a common misconception is that the uh, buffets are free. They're not all free anymore. Cheap, very cheap, not free. Nevada has a lot more to offer than just cheap food. It's the only state with a museum entirely devoted to Liberace. There's one slot machine for every 10 residents. And in the sinful city of Las Vegas, there are more churches per capita than almost any other town in America. Of course, that includes wedding chapels. More of Nevada land is owned by the federal government than any other state, 84.5%. Much of it is inhospitable desert, where nearly 1,000 nuclear weapons tests were once conducted. But the lack of private land hasn't cramped the state's independent spirit. They have a long, rugged pioneer history, uh, starting with the gold mining in the early days, the ranching. They control their destiny. They do what they feel is important. In Nevada, they do what they want to do when they want to do it, uh, so much so that you can strap on a, a six-shooter and walk down the main street of Las Vegas, and it's legal. Nevada is a place of contrast and contradiction. It has one of the smallest populations, but it's also one of America's fastest-growing states. Its arid deserts have made it the driest state in the Union, but it also has more mountain ranges than anywhere else, including Alaska. Nevada actually means snow-capped in Spanish, but in English, most out-of-staters have trouble pronouncing its name. People mispronounce our state name all the time. You get the Nevada, Nevada. That is like potato or patata. <laughs> it's kind of like tomato and tomato. It is Nevada, <laughs> Nevada. Need proof? Check out the new specialty state license plate that actually shows the name with a phonetic spelling. Nevada is often called the Silver State, the perfect name for a place that's built on gambling money, over $10 billion in taxable income each year. But the Silver State was also built on gold mining. A lot of people don't realize, even Nevadans don't realize, that Nevada is the third largest gold producing region in the world, behind South Africa, which is one, and Australia, which is two. Just about 10 million ounces of the precious metal were mined in Nevada in 2005, valued at more than $3 billion. So much of this state seems larger than life, like Hoover Dam. It took 21,000 men and five years to build, yet it came in two years ahead of schedule. At 726 feet, it's 171 feet taller than the Washington Monument in DC. The dam is filled with 3.25 million cubic yards of concrete. That's enough to pave a standard two-lane highway from New York all the way to San Francisco. 
Despite Nevada's wide open and empty spaces, 95% of its population is crammed into just 19% of the state's territory. The areas that make up metropolitan Reno, Carson City, and Las Vegas. Since the early 1990s, greater Las Vegas has boomed. Suburbs have encroached on the surrounding desert, dotting the arid beige landscape with sprinkler-fed oases of green. The growth is staggering. A new home is built every nine hours. 60 new streets are paved every month. The massive building boom that's accompanied the influx of newcomers even prompted the governor to suggest that the state bird should be changed to the construction crane. Nevada got its first growth spurt thanks to the largest silver deposit ever discovered, anywhere. Two Irish miners, Peter O'Reilly and Patrick McLaughlin, were prospecting on the slopes of Mount Davidson when they came upon traces of gold and silver. So they know they've hit something very important. Who comes out of the sagebrush? Henry Page Comstock. And he claims that that's his land. So these guys said, well, better to bring him on board and make him a partner than let him go spill the beans down at the saloons. And then everybody's going to come over and take over the project. Well, the Comstock load put Nevada on the map, quite literally. It was producing so much wealth. By 1861, the federal government adopted Nevada as a territory, and only three years later, in 1864, Nevada became a state. During its prime production years, from 1861 to 1878, the Comstock load yielded over $400 million in silver and gold, the equivalent of $5 billion today. Thousands of prospectors poured into Nevada. Mining camps became centers of fabulous wealth. One young man who came seeking his fortune was an obscure writer from Missouri. Before it became known as Mark Twain, the very famous American author and humorist, uh, Sam Clements came to Nevada in 1862, and he was acting editor of the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise for a short period of time, and got into a little uh, tiff with the other competing newspaper's editor, and it uh, turned out their words became very heated, and a duel was proposed. However, it was a new felony to participate in a duel, and under the threat of arrest, Mark Twain fled the Comstock for good. Nevada's mining towns were notorious for their drinking, gambling, and prostitution. Many Americans were scandalized by such sinful behavior, and in 1910, the state legislature finally banned gaming. Even though Nevada had outlawed gambling, the fact was that people were still gambling all the time and everywhere, but the state was cut out of the revenue because they couldn't tax it. And they said, we are going to legalize gambling, and it can become part of the economy of the state. This created a major sensation in the United States to the point where Congress actually convened to determine whether or not they could revoke the statehood of Nevada. Efforts to punish Nevada for its wicked ways never got very far, and the gaming industry grew in popularity. In 1941, most of the action was in Reno, but very soon, Las Vegas would become the new hotspot with the construction of a place called El Rancho Vegas. It was the first casino resort with gambling lodging, and entertainment, all under one roof. El Rancho Vegas set the standard for every hotel casino that followed on the Vegas Strip. Bugsy Siegel used the same model to develop his Flamingo Hotel on the other side of the Strip. Bugsy Siegel showed the mobsters all throughout the country that they could come to Nevada, discontinue being criminals, and become legitimate businessmen as soon as they crossed the state line. Jake Friedman built the Sands in 1952. He was a gambler from Texas who had the bright idea to sell Frank Sinatra a few ownership points in the property. That gave Sinatra an interest in making the sand successful, and Sinatra performed in the famous Copa Room for 15 years after that with his buddies, Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin and Joey Bishop and all the rest of the Rat Pack. In less than 100 years, Las Vegas has gone from a fly speck on the map to a tourist destination that hosts 38 million visitors annually. With more hotel rooms than any city in the world, it would take one person 288 years to spend a night in each hotel room in Las Vegas. But there's one place in Nevada that you can't visit, because officially it doesn't exist. It's called Area 51. Area 51 is a super secret, highly classified air base about 60 miles north of Las Vegas. Rumor has it that the Air Force conducts secret experiments in large tunnels deeply buried below the surface. Area 51, it's a very well-kept secret. I have heard many stories about uh, UFOs being stored there. Uh, the spy satellites, top secret facilities, black projects. You can only go so far towards it, then you have guards uh, telling you to turn around and go back. I don't think I want to know too much, because 
It's kind of scary. Strange aerial sightings are commonly reported in the area. UFO believers claim that the nearby town of Rachel, Nevada, is one of the most alien visited sites in the country. In 1996, state officials acknowledged the peculiarities. Route 375, which runs near Area 51, was designated the extraterrestrial highway, proving that Nevada has a little something for everybody. We have entertainment, we have food, we have hotels, and we have underground nuclear testing. It's really the only state that has everything. This next state wants everyone to know that the king of rock and roll was raised in a modest two-bedroom house that still draws nearly 100,000 visitors a year. Born on January 8, 1935, this is where Elvis Presley came of age, in a small town called Tupelo. Greetings from Mississippi, which became the 20th state to join the Union on December 10, 1817. In terms of population, it ranks 31st in the nation, with nearly 3 million residents. Well, where we lived, we never had electricity until I was 16 years old. Across that cotton belt, no electricity. Only in the towns, the city. But at the church, we had electricity. And the pastor played guitar. And he showed me three chords. Three chords. One, four, and five. Would you believe I use them today? Mississippi preachers have had a big influence on this Bible Belt state. 57% of its citizens say they are churchgoers. The nation's largest Bible binding plant is in Greenwood, Mississippi. The Bible may well be the most read book in the state, but this is also the home of a national bestseller called The Sweet Potato Queen's Book of Love. Jill Connor Brown's Guide to Life and Love in the Deep South has sold over 250,000 copies and has a cult following all over the world. There's a chapter of Sweet Potato Queens in Saudi Arabia. Their motto is no veils for us. With over 5,000 chapters in 20 countries, the Sweet Potato Queens are still actively recruiting for their annual St. Patrick's Day Parade in Jackson, Mississippi. Sweet potatoes, however, are not the crop most folks identify with Mississippi. Until very recently, cotton was at the heart of what Mississippi was all about. It was the centerpiece of not just the economy, but the social structure and the way of life. The booming textile industry in the northern states and in Europe created an unprecedented demand for cotton in the 19th and early 20th centuries. If you sat down and designed a place whose weather was perfect for cotton growing, you'd get Mississippi's weather patterns. The perfect blend of hot air and moist soil provided the state with $468 million in cotton revenue in 2005. Cotton has always been big business in Mississippi. But when the Civil War hit in 1861, production declined. Following the war, the industry rebounded as freed slaves went on to work their own fields. The Reconstruction effort hit full stride when Mississippi elected the first two African-American senators in U.S. history, Hiram Revels and Blanche Bruce. Blanche Kelso Bruce was born into slavery and tutored alongside his master's son. After the war, he acquired land and built a prosperous plantation employing mostly black tenant farmers. Bruce was actually considered for a cabinet post more than once by Republican presidents. After he finished his term as senator, he was appointed Register of the Treasury, at that point the highest appointive office that a black had ever held in America. It was here in the Mississippi Delta in the late 19th century that former slaves and their descendants drew inspiration from their hard times. What emerged was a distinct musical form that came to be called the blues. The blues as an art form is truly American and, and truly African-American. It, it grew up here in the Delta uh, following the Civil War. Blues music evolved from generations of slave songs in the Delta region. Mississippi bluesmen like Charlie Patton, Howlin' Wolf, and Muddy Waters spread their music up the river to Memphis, St. Louis, and eventually Chicago. I would say blues is life. Life as we lived it in the past, as we live it today, as I believe, we'll live it tomorrow because it has to do with people, places, and things. And I believe that as long as you've got people, places, and things, you will have blues. Blues is a feeling, and it's all about life. It's your, it's your buddy in good times, and it's your comforter in hard times. Man needs honey. Gets him when he could. Stinging always. Feels so good. 
Today, people across the globe recognize the Mississippi Delta as the birthplace of the blues. People revere this ground. I mean, they come here to kiss the dirt under the crossroads. The legendary crossroad. This is where Robert Johnson supposedly sold his soul to the devil in order to learn how to play. Clarksdale's Ground Zero Blues Club and the Delta Blues Museum are doing their part to ensure that the legacy of Mississippi blues music is kept alive. We get the kids together every day from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock, Monday through Thursdays, and we teach the kids about the blues, uh, the blues music, about the genre, the history of the genre of music. Um, we also teach them how to play the different instruments. Um, he's five years old, I believe, and uh, he started the program a couple of years ago, and he's an awesome drummer. You know, I've been around doing this now almost 60 years. And the highlight of my career was in 2005. I was invited by the Mississippi legislators to come to the Capitol, which is a place I never went. They stopped for 45 minutes, the state's business, and talked with one little guy from the Delta. I was so touched, I cried. This next state may be best known for its biggest national park and its unique license plate. One is the home of a geyser that you can set your watch by. The other shows a cowboy hanging on for dear life. Greetings from Wyoming. On July 10th, 1890, it became the 44th state to enter the Union. With a population of only 515,000, this state has the fewest people in the nation. A lot of states have cowboys, but only Wyoming is officially nicknamed the Cowboy State. In the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, almost every community in Wyoming had a rodeo. The best known is Cheyenne Frontier Days, which started back in 1897, and it is still going on today. And that is just about the largest in, in the country as for an outdoor rodeo. We were the first state to put a symbol on a license plate, and the symbol on the license plate is a cowboy riding a bucking bronc. And there was a man named Clayton Danks, who was a rugged cowboy from Fremont County, and he rode the horse Steamboat. Steamboat was a bucking horse that they say when it came down, he came down on all four legs, that the shock effect would sometimes cause a cowboy to have a nosebleed. Now, that's a horse. Few outsiders realize that Wyoming has another well-earned nickname, the Equality State. Back in 1869, the territorial government granted women the right to vote, a full 50 years before the 19th Amendment guaranteed that right to women nationwide. In 1890, Wyoming wanted to enter the Union, and our territorial delegate was Joseph Carey. He sent a telegram back to the Wyoming legislature and said, the states don't want to let us in because we let women vote, and none of them do. And the Wyoming legislature sent a telegram and said, Wyoming is ready to wait a hundred years, if need be. We are not coming in without the women. And so, bright women who had been educated in, in the East, who couldn't vote, they weren't just suffragists, they were just people who were damn sick and tired of being disenfranchised, and they came West because they could get the right to vote and participate. Over the years, women have been named to significant positions in Wyoming. The first woman judge in America was a woman named Esther Hobart Morris, who was the Justice of the Peace up in South Pass City. The first woman governor anywhere in America was Nellie Taylor Ross, elected in Wyoming in 1924. Harriet Elizabeth Byrd carried on the tradition of Esther Hobart when she became the first African-American woman elected to the Wyoming State Legislature. I really consider it to be a legacy and uh, that I would carry the same ideals that Esther Hobart Morris had while I was in the Wyoming State Legislature. For many people, Wyoming is all about the beauty of its natural wonders. But this is also the home of that all-American tall tale, the jackalope. Taxidermist Doug Herrick may have concocted the jackalope as a practical joke in the late 1930s, but before long, the mythical creature was turned into a tourist attraction. I actually shot one. The jackalope that I shot is on display here, and he's one of the larger ones that has been ever shot in the history of Wyoming. Though farms and cattle ranches cover most of Wyoming, the state's greatest source of wealth lies beneath the topsoil. We are, of course, the number one producer of coal in the United States. That translates to more than 400 million tons of coal a year. But the fastest growing business may be tourism. Yellowstone alone welcomes three million tourists every year. 
The first white man to see Yellowstone was John Coulter, an experienced explorer who had traveled the continent twice with Lewis and Clark. Rather than return home in 1807, Coulter went to Wyoming. He came back with fantastic tales of a land of fire and brimstone, a place where flames burned underground and smoke rose from a deep pit. After trapper Jim Bridger traveled above the Snake River 50 years later, he told stories of water puddles that could boil an egg, towering plumes of steam, and entire mountains made of glass. People would say, well, he's just lying. There's really no thing like that. In 1871, the first scientific expedition to Yellowstone Valley finally confirmed that the tall tales of Coulter and Bridger were actually true. This was the first time that parts of the park were photographed. And so people in the east, in Washington, D.C., were able to see how wondrous uh, Yellowstone Park truly was. And so then they began talking about maybe this should become a national park. In 1872, President Grant signed the law creating Yellowstone, which carved out of the territory of Wyoming a park as big as the state of Connecticut, the first national park in the world. The geysers of Yellowstone are the result of lava flowing beneath the park. Magma heats water that must be released by a convection. The lava's proximity to the surface is the cause of most of the wonders here, leaving the park's visitors with a heavenly vision of phenomena that few, at first, believed to exist. Once you go to Yellowstone, you'll never forget it. It's beautiful. Their given names are forgettable, Robert Leroy Parker and Harry Longabow. In the lore of the Wild West, however, their aliases will live forever. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Butch was born in rural Utah in 1866, the son of Mormons. Harry Longabow was born a year later in Pennsylvania but his family soon made its way west. Butch Cassidy got his nickname from being a butcher in my hometown of Rock Springs. The Sundance Kid got his name because after his first robbery, he was arrested and jailed in Sundance, Wyoming. Butch successfully eluded the law for years, but was captured and sent to the Wyoming Territorial Prison in 1894. It was the only time that he did any prison time, and it wasn't for robbing a bank, and it wasn't for robbing a train, it was for stealing horses up near present-day Lander, Wyoming. Some say he was set up, some others say that, you know, he actually did commit that crime, and he was supposed to spend two years here behind our bars, but after a year and six months, he was actually pardoned by the governor. Butch and Sundance eventually teamed up and gathered a gang of like-minded bandits. Their headquarters was a remote Wyoming canyon called the Hole in the Wall. Though undeniably outlaws, not everybody viewed them as villains. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid used to claim uh, that they did not use violence. And uh, Butch Cassidy said, I never shot anyone. Now, he wasn't about blowing up a safe. By the 20th century, the Wild West era was coming to a close. Butch and Sundance bade farewell to Wyoming in 1901 to continue their criminal career in South America. Some say they died in a shootout with the Bolivian army. Others claim Butch escaped and quit his life of crime. A lot of people who live in Wyoming still believe that he actually came back, changed his identity again, and blended in with the community. Wyoming is, is deeply involved in preserving its history uh, and its culture. And I think that shows the worth of, of concerned people, dedicated people, proud people.